Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session and thank you to the speakers. Um, today we have Sam, Rob, Eddie, and as, I think we have, is Eddie there? Yes, he's on his way, you said. And, and, and Eddie's, Eddie's off today. Um, it's just me, I'm going solo. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, all right. Um, I was just saying you, uh, the participants today probably know the speakers more than I do, uh, but I'll just very quickly for those of you who may not know, just go through uh, a little uh, blurb that they sent us. Sam, Sam Barclay, senior lecturer at, uh, uh, of TESOL in Nottingham Trent University. Um, Rob Playfair uh, teaches the AP at the University of Liverpool. Um, and Wayne Rimmer is an AMP, EAP instructor at Manchester University. And so if you've had a look at the abstracts, I'm sure you have, uh, we're going to hear about uh, rating scales and about the TAPSIG uh, piloting network. Sounds really interesting. And item analysis through a virtual learning environment. So there's a bit for uh, everyone. So really looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Um, and that's all I'll say. I'll just let you share your slides and I'll mute myself. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. Let me just try and share my slides. This is the bit that always gives me heart palpitations. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Yes, I do. That, can you all see that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. fantastic. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. So and thanks for coming, guys. The idea of today's session is to talk about um, EAP assessment and the scholarship into EAP, EAP, EAP assessment. But we're going to try and demonstrate how we can conduct scholarship without kind of massively adding to our workloads. I suppose that's the kind of the general aim, how we can do it in the background, how we might be able to repurpose some of the things we already do, investigate them using tools that already exist or, or networks that we have, and how we can exploit those to, to achieve um, our scholarship ambitions. So um, as we've just been introduced, I'm Sam Barclay. Um, I'll let the other guys introduce themselves as well briefly, but just to say, um, about you know, my relationship with assessment is that at Nottingham Trent University, um, I, work on, I work in two roles really, on the pre-sessional course where I work, uh, where I develop the materials and the assessments for our summer pre-sessional course. Um, so I'm the assessment and, and materials coordinator. And then I also work on our MA ELT and MA TESOL programs. And I lead the courses on um, course design and assessment, materials design, and also with kind of specific expertise in vocabulary. Uh, teaching, learning, and assessing. So that's kind of the way I come. Uh, I come at assessment from a from a teaching background, but also from kind of a theoretical uh, background. Um, Rob, over to you. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I, hi, I'm Rob. So I, I teach um, EAP at the uh, University of Liverpool. Um, my my role at the moment actually doesn't involve any formal test development, but in previous roles, I worked on kind of pre pre-sessional um, and foundation year. A test development. So I, at the moment I work on in-sessional but I, I, ha I have an interest in the kind of practitioner side of things like the, the people who do the test development um, and the kind of context in which in which they do <laughs> they, 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 they do EAP test development. So that's the kind of perspective I'm coming from. Um, I'm, I'm, all, I'm also working on, on um, in the TASIC committee like everyone actually speaking today and um, I'll be talking about the piloting network and scholarship in, into that. Great, and then over to you, Wales. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome, thanks a lot for coming. Um, at the moment, we're working on kind of repurposing our tests back to face and face, back to face to face, because like everyone, there was that kind of sudden shift to online. And while we've kind of appreciated the advantages of that, we are getting students coming back face to face now. So. We're looking at kind of hybrid formats and repurposing the um, assessment for in session and pre-session again. Fantastic, thanks, guys. And just to say that, um, yeah, Eddie, as we mentioned earlier, can't be with us today, but he was he is involved and and was involved with the design um, of the study that Rob will present. Um, so he's very much here, but um, spirit and uh, reflected in in the uh, in that presentation. So just to give a really brief plan for today, 
Um, we've got these three talks and then a discussion. First of all, um, I'm going to talk about repurposing rating scales to evaluate EAP course quality. And then Rob's going to talk about the TAF-SIG piloting network and how we can explore EAT practitioners, uh, EAP practitioners and their, their kind of reasons for joining. And then finally, Wayne's going to talk about virtual learning environments and how we can use them for item analysis. And then what we really want to get to and leave lots of time for is the discussion section where there's been an opportunity for us all either in one big group or maybe in a couple of breakout, group, breakout groups um, to discuss um, our own, your, your projects um, and how you might evaluate um, your assessment, feedback or, or testing and how you can develop scholarship in that area. And then once we've had the discussions in small groups, we hope they'll feed into a kind of a plenary discussion at the end, the last 10 minutes where we can maybe comment, everyone can comment each other's ideas and, and hopefully develop some really exciting uh, uh, proposals and ideas to move forward um, with more EAP um, assessment uh, scholarship. So I'll crack, if there are no more questions. If you do have any, if you have questions, just obviously chuck them in the chat, in the, uh, uh, in the chat box. But I'm going to talk about how you can repurpose uh, rating scales to evaluate EAP course quality. So we all know that um, I'm sure you've seen this kind of diagram before. This is a, a diagram of the uh, course evaluation, uh, the, course, sorry, the course development cycle. We start with needs analysis and then we go into creating the curriculum and then implementing it and then evaluating it and how then we might design tasks or questions. We might redesign things and that goes back into needs analysis. And we have this kind of iterative approach to course design. But the problem with this is that often, at least in EAP and pre-sessional contexts, we get stuff in this, we get stuck in this kind of implementation cycle where we might implement the course and not really have time to evaluate it properly. Or we do evaluate it, but we can't really do much with the uh, evaluation data because we're straight back into another pre-sessional. I don't know what it's like where you are, but here we have courses in the summer, then we have one in the autumn term, then we have one internationally in the spring term. So there's really no opportunities to, whether well, it's difficult to develop um, uh, our course. So this is the idea that, yeah, we want to be iterative, but it can be challenging. Now, if we think about evaluation, there are two types of materials evaluation. And that's what I'm really thinking about here. Uh, the first is predictive where we might select materials. And then the second is retrospective, where we're kind of determining whether instruction has worked or not. And largely the focus of studies to date has been on this predictive um, evaluation. And actually, if you just do a quick search for evaluating materials, the vast majority of studies look at how we can choose textbooks, how we can choose um, materials, uh, that kind of thing. Very little has been done on actually how we can evaluate the quality um, of the materials that we use. So when we think about retrospective evaluations, then there are a number of different measures that we can use. We've got structural measures like attendance and uh, VLE access data. We have outcome measures such as kind of tracking that might include tracking studies or looking at attainment data, kind of test data. Um, then we have perception measures. So things like student satisfaction, questionnaires, and then we have process tools such as student journals, teacher journals we could add here perhaps, and then also teacher observations and classroom observations. Maybe in the, in the chat box, guys, you could just say which of these tools you use or you have used to um, evaluate uh, your classes or a course that you work on. So I can see that that's great. This is there, number three, mostly perception, satisfaction, teacher satisfaction. One, three, and four. Okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> Two is a right pain. Yeah, tracking study is really tough. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, really interesting point there that even though you might use kind of you might use a combination they might each one might be used for a slightly different purpose and I think that's a really important point to make that there is definitely a time and a place for um, perception data but there are certainly limitations with perception data that I'm sure we all know about right that often it just turns into a, a popularity contest or students might like a teacher and so report um, positively um, on the course so yeah it, we tend I mean looking at the literature perception measures, particularly student satisfaction questionnaires, um, 
or teacher satisfaction or teacher perception data at the end of a course seem to dominate, yeah? But as we've just mentioned, there, there are problems with this kind of data. Yeah, I don't think we need to go into too, that in too much detail. Um, so what I thought might be useful here and give us a more objective perspective on course quality is assessment criteria and whether we can repurpose assessment criteria to conduct uh, materials evaluation. So I'm sure we all know what assessment criteria looks like. Here you can see one that we use um, at NTU and we have the different dimensions and then we have the scales and you'll see it in a different in a different format later on but I'm sure this kind of thing is familiar to you. So there are two types of assessment criteria broadly we've got holistic and analytic again I don't think I probably need to go into detail here because you guys will all be familiar with these terms. Holistic I'm sure you know is just one grade overall analytic we might break it down into different dimensions yeah um, and what I'm interested in doing then is looking at whether we can use analytic rating scales and rated graded uh, analytic rating scales to conduct micro evaluations so not just saying whether the course is working overall but looking at the quality of different parts of the course okay different activities essentially and because different activities on this on our course anyway are associated are all constructively aligned to the learning outcomes we can then retrospectively analyze whether the activities have helped learners meet those learning outcomes that makes sense. That's the kind of general theme I'm going to be um, pursuing. So let me tell you about how I did this. So prior to the using the assessment criteria, and I should say the assessment criteria were used to grade the students' work. Um, I was just repurposing them for evaluation. Uh, what I did was just kind of blow up the assessment criteria, not in the literal sense. Uh, but here we have a general uh, a, a performance descriptor. And as you, this might be kind of familiar, we've got two sentences here and we're targeting a couple of things, really, if you were going to look at this performance, uh, this, this performance descriptor. And often we might highlight it and you might highlight like one sentence from one, one uh, level and another sentence from another level to indicate performance. So all I did was blow it up and have argument one and argument two just to make it a little bit more uh, specific. OK. Then I turned it into a Microsoft form. So here, rather than, the, rather than the teachers having to highlight the different criteria, they would just click in Microsoft Form whether AR1 was A, B, C, D, or E, and AR2 was A, B, C, D, or E. And then they would give an overall rating for, for argument as well. Okay. The reason why this is really important is because essentially it just produces electronic data, right? So like an Excel file. I can then download and use that to analyze how the students are performing on each sub criterion. And that's, as I said, as that's aligned with the materials, I can then evaluate how, whether the materials are helping the students um, achieve uh, the, requ the requisite level of um, performance uh, against each sub criterion. So after, as I said, after the, we use the assessment criteria for grading, I produced the grades as we normally would do. I then repurposed the ratings to find underperforming elements I can, in, in order to do that, I calculated the descriptive statistics. I then compared performance of different groups, and we're going to look at different course lengths here. And then I amended the materials to support problematic areas, and I reconducted analysis the next year and the next year and the next year, just to see if there's any development. Um, so let's just have a look at uh, the student sample. So there are 190 completed assessment matrices. matrices. We're quite a small precessional here at NTU. Um, and you can see we've got students on different course lengths and we have um, uh, other characteristics of the learners as well. And I conducted this analysis for lots of for different for formative and summative assessments. But today we're just going to talk about the plan, the final draft, the presentation and the writing test. OK, so here you can see then what it looks like for the uh, plan. And we're just looking at this to give you an idea, just 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 show you kind of an idea of what I saw when I analyzed the data. So here you can see the middle, the uh, the dot in the middle is the mean score, and then we've got plus minus one standard deviation. Okay, and the, you can see there's a red line that goes from three. That's our passing grade. Okay, so anything above that is kind of largely unproblematic. Anything that comes below that, we want to we might want to think about and consider how we can develop materials to improve performance in those areas. Okay. So you can see that this is the formative plan. If we then go into the coursework essay, looking at this, you might be able to notice that some areas are underperforming, right? Some are performing better than others. 
for example, here we have UOS4, the use of sources for, and this is about summarizing and paraphrasing. Okay, I'll come back to that in a bit. And then we have these two here, which are identified as kind of needing attention. So we've got U, uh, OCC2, which is about paragraph structure. Okay, and then we have UOS2, use of sources two, and that's about synthesis. We know these are difficult areas, right? We know often learners will, will struggle with, with paragraph structure and with synthesis. But what this shows us is that actually the materials aren't helping some learners um, develop the requisite skills in these areas. Okay, and that's quite powerful for me as a materials developer. Um, if we go on to the timed writing, you can see again we have paragraph structure as weak. And again, synthesis is an issue here. If we look at the presentation, we can see that uh, cohesion one about kind of narrowing the topic, that's kind of a little bit low. And then we have content one. And this is again about summarizing synthesis and evaluating information and ideas. Again, not easy areas, but these are things we might want to think about when we're tweaking the materials for using the next time. So that's a real kind of a really quick look at the data that I saw. But actually, we can start to do some pretty interesting things with it. So like we can cut the data by course length to see if certain learners are advantaged or are performing better with the materials than others. If we had a bigger, uh, a bit of, bigger cohort, we could analyze it in different ways. I mean, in assessment, there's this notion of differential item functioning where certain quest test items will function differently for different learner groups. So um, a learner whose first language is Tagalog might, do, might be more likely to do better on an item if their language, first language is Japanese, for example. And we can kind of look at this data in the same way. Um, okay, so we're going to look at course length and kind of cut the data by course length. And again, just to talk about this, um, what you're seeing here, uh, the yellow line is the longest course, that's the 20-week course. The gray line is the 15-week the course. The orange line is the 10-week course. And the blue line is the six-week course. And I should say that the, the longer courses feed into the shorter courses. Okay, they're all doing the six-week course at the, uh, together. So what we see is that actually the 20 week students are performing really well on the essay plan. Yeah. But the 15 week students might need more support with structure and with selecting course material. So again, this is helping us target how we can actually develop the course and better meet these the needs of these learner groups. OK. Here we have the coursework essay. And what we can see is overall the gray line is lower, right? So 15 week students seem to struggle with organization, cohesion and coherence. So we need to look at the materials and emphasize this during teacher induction. Now there's one data point that really jumps out, right? <laughs> this one here. And this is showing that our 20 week students are struggling with synthesis. If we move on to the timed writing, we can see that the longer course students OK, so here we have the yellow line. Now the longer course students are synthesizing well. So the students seem to be synthesizing better on the time of writing than they do on the coursework essay, which is kind of interesting, right? And when we're thinking about why this is the case, it might be that the issue is not really synthesis. It's just the number of sources they have to synthesize. So on a coursework essay, they're, they're synthesizing 8, 10, 12 different sources. Whereas on the time of writing, they're looking at three or four different sources. And actually, this maybe helps us well, helps us reflect on the construct of synthesis in a timed writing versus a coursework essay. And maybe uh, there are some interesting questions we could, we could uh, explore there. If we look at the presentation, we can see that shorter course students outperform longer course students. So here we have the blue line and the orange line is generally higher, yeah, which we might expect. Um, and we have 15 week students struggle again, struggle with the interpretation stance. And what's unique to the presentation is about focusing the topic. So we can see that these students need more support. And again, we have these longer course students, the long uh, students struggling, struggling when they have to synthesize many different sources. OK. So that's just a real, really quick snapshot. I think that's all we can do today. But the idea is to to show how we can use summative assessment matrices, matrices to conduct materials evaluation. And essentially what we're doing here then is we're assessing sub, each sub-criterion equated to a micro-evaluation. 
Yeah, because each subcriterion is associated with certain activities in the materials. Based on this data, we can then go back and tweak those activities and then test in the next iteration of the course whether the manipulations have made any um, impact. So I'd say that this allowed for nuanced materials and kind of the uh, amendments of the instruction. And the really good news for us, the really good news is because it was all done kind of electronically, because they were doing it via MS forms, the data was electronic. So it was so quick to conduct this analysis. All I had to do was literally conduct, um, uh, calculate the descriptive statistics and then just look for outliers. So I think it could be, well, it did. I could do it in a really busy pre-sessional calendar. Um, okay, it's harder to implement the changes. That takes a bit more time, of course, but actually having this data is really powerful. Um, so I think that's about enough for me. I've probably gone over my allotted time. Uh, and if you do have any questions, um, either put them in the chat now and I can respond to them in the chat or just keep them in mind and we can discuss them uh, later on. Okay. Um, so Rob, over to you. And then, yeah, I think let's, should we save the questions for later? What do you think, guys? Is that the best thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. that's fine with me. I've, I've put a question in anyway. But um, Okay. Maybe we can talk yeah, about cheers. that. Um, thanks very much for that, Sam. That was that was great. Really, really interesting and um, completely different from my one as well. So we're going to have a really nice uh, variety, I think. Now, um, let let me just share my um, share my screen and I'm going to try to slideshow mode as well. Okay, is that working? Yeah, thanks, Letitia. Okay, so. Um, hi everyone, um, so I'm, I'm Rob, and as Sam said, um, I prepared this talk with Eddie, but unfortunately he can't be here today, but this is very much a collaborative effort between the two of us. Um, so Eddie works at the um, Pathway College at the University of York, and he's the assessment lead there. And um, as I said earlier, I'm, uh, I work at the University of Liverpool as an EAP um, tutor. So the title of this session is um, methods to explore why EAP practitioners joined the TAFSIG piloting network. Um, so what, what I'm gonna be talking about today, this is kind of outline. I'm gonna start just giving a bit of background about the um, piloting network, um, cause that's kind of the context for the, the research that I'm talking, sharing today. Um, and then a little bit about the motivation for the study and the design of the research. Then in the second part of the talk, I wanna um, kind of address Sam's um, the theme of this this event, which is this idea of like low resource research, so stuff that doesn't um, break the bank in terms of time um, and money. And the three areas that I'm going to focus on are um, collaboration, ethics, and what we're calling guerrilla thematic analysis. Um, and these are kind of ways that we managed to, I think, kind of work within the quite limited constraints that we had to conduct this um, this research. And then at the end, I think we're going to have um, a bit of time briefly just to share a finding from the research that I think is relevant to today's event and might kind of help contribute to discussions that we have later on. Okay, so um, TAFSIG piloting network. Well, Eddie and I set, set this up um, last year, I think it was October where we, when we launched it. And this, this on, on the website, this is the sort of the main aim. And um, we said the main aim is to bring test developers together to offer reciprocal help in sourcing appropriate test taker groups pilot language tests. Um, and it kind of came about from um, our own frustrations about trying to complete this really important step in the test development process, but logistically difficult or in some cases impossible. Um, and we found once we kind of set up TAF, the, the TAFSIG as well, a couple of years ago, this was kind of widely felt throughout the, the community. Um, and we wanted, to, we wanted to kind of create a, a network that was quite inclusive as well, because um, I think it's, it's quite easy to settle into, you know, if you have certain professional relationships with people in other institutions, it's, that, that's great because you can develop a you know, piloting relationship with them, but not everybody has access to that. So the, the idea of this network was that it was open to, to everyone to be able to, uh, you know, regardless of your professional or, or personal contacts um, in, in EAP. So um, in terms of motivation, um, this, this kind of quote from um, Dan Belcher kind of, I think, summarizes our, our motivation. I'll just give you a second to read it.
so so the main thing really is this this idea of understanding the community of ESP or EAP in this case, um, professionals as, as teachers, um, understanding that context that you know the working context of um, of us of ourselves, and uh, we were kind of thinking that this is kind of especially true for EAP assessment. Um, one, I mean, one of the things that we found is that in EAP sent in EAP units, there's often only a few people who work in. Um, uh, oh, sorry, there's actually a knock at the door. I'm really sorry, guys, but I'm just going to have to get that. Sorry. Really sorry about that, guys. Um, working from home. Um, yeah, so we thought that, um, uh, yeah, it's especially true for EAP um, uh, assessment, because there's quite a lot have been, has been said about materials, course design, um, pedagogy, um, but maybe a bit less so about the EAP assessment, which kind of led to our um, overarching sort of motivation was thinking, you know, is, is the TASIG piloting network likely to achieve its purposes? Is it going to connect um, EAP practitioners and allow us to do those things that we want we want to do um, in terms of test piloting. So in terms of research design, um, I won't go into this too much, but we use this book, um, Robert Yin's book about case studies. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, sorry, um, just to say that at, at the time we were thinking about this, we also had, um, we saw a call for chapters um, in a book about language assessment literacy. So Eddie and I kind of thought that it would be a good sort of motivation to actually get on with doing some research into this area if we had the deadline and the fear of having to prepare a, um, a chapter for publication. So we, we kind of combined preparing for that, that chapter with our research into this, this area. Okay, so um, we followed this, uh, we took a kind of case study approach. So this, as I said, this Robert, Robert Yin book is, we found really, really useful. And he kind of suggests these, these five, five stages. So you start with the research question. And for us, it was this idea of why do teachers choose to join the piloting network? Because we felt that understanding motivations for that would help us make sure that the network was actually doing what we wanted it to, to do. Um, and then Yin suggests that from that, you generate some propositions. So these are you know, possible answers to the research question based on either our own experiences or, or the literature. So we came up with a few ideas we were thinking could be perhaps to do with departmental context. Um, it could be to do with the teacher's individual assessment literacy or, or perhaps even professional or personal development. You know, this idea of connecting with other people um, in other centers um, as a kind of CPD opportunity. Um, the next stage was to decide what data sources we wanted. So we, we chose um, individual interviews um, with, we, we managed to get nine users of the network. So these were nine people who'd signed up to join the piloty network. Um, and we also had a follow-up focus group after, um, after the interviews. Uh, in step four, we, we did some analysis. Um, and what Yin suggests is that you kind of look at your original propositions and the data that you've got and see how, how far does the data fit those propositions whilst at the same time trying to think of kind of rival, rival explanations. So, um, you know, trying to disprove those propositions as much as proving them, um, which we found quite useful in terms of focusing our analysis. We used this thematic analysis from Brown and Clark, but we did adapt that quite a lot, mainly because of time constraints, which I'll, I'll talk about again in a, in a second. Um, and the last step for us really here was um, verification of um, the analysis. So Eddie and I were working together, we were kind of coding both coding all of the data that we had. So we were kind of checking each other's coding, but we also had this focus group with participants um, after we'd done the analysis, um, where we kind of shared our analysis and our interpretations with them and got some feedback and some comments to help us kind of, you know, enhance and, and check what we were, um, what we were thinking. Uh, we found that really, really helpful. Okay, um, so, yeah, like I said, the second part of the session, I really want to focus on this kind of low resource research um, area. Um, now, neither Eddie nor I have got any scholarship allocation in our in our contract. So all work on this was kind of done um, in, uh, you know, squeezed around our full time work uh, and quite often in evenings and, and weekends. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible to do this alone, certainly not within the timeline for the 
for the chapter proposal that we were trying to prepare. Um, but also in terms of motivation, I think it would have been really hard to keep going if, if we just worked on this by ourselves. So um, I'm going to give just three examples of how these kind of low resources, how we, how we worked within these low resources to try to do as good a job as we could. Um, so the first point is about collaboration. Uh, so as I said, Eddie and I work really, really closely together on this. And I've just listed out some of the stages of getting this um, project together and who did them, because that I think that was really kind of um, key to making it work. So for, to, to put the chapter proposal together, both Eddie and I worked on that together. Once we got a confirmation that the, you know, we, we, we our proposal was accepted, we realized we had to have ethical approval. And um, it can be quite a, a scary prospect to do that. And especially at Liverpool, it's uh, basically all the ethics departments, had, had, um, the ethics form is designed for scientific medical research. Um, and it takes a long time to get that through. So um, Eddie created a departmental ethics committee. I'll talk about that in a bit, but that took him that quite a big, big job that he did. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. And so whilst he was doing that, um, I worked on the research design and recruited participants. So we were kind of doing them in, in tandem, but we couldn't properly recruit participants until we got the ethics approval. So it was kind of a bit of a, um, a, a race really to, 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 to make sure we got those two done at the same time. Um, following that, we both scheduled, we conducted interviews, we, we divvied up the interviews between us. So we, so we did um, about half each. Um, we analyzed and checked the data and we also had participants helping us there as well to check to check the data, which was really um, kind of key um, in terms of collaboration. And the final point is um, this idea of weekly meetings as well. Um, that kept us focused, kept us on task um, throughout the project. Now, this this was going to be Eddie's Eddie's slide, so I'm not going to say too much about it. But um, basically, he he set up an ethics committee at at the in the language centre at York um, in an incredibly quick time but he did it in a very it seemed to do it in a very thorough way as well so these are just some of the stages that he went through in terms of researching what had been done um, in other departments and then he used what what was currently going on around the university to kind of develop a, um, a template for for the um, language center and we were the first our, our project was the first kind of trial project to go through that um, that process um, I guess the main thing to say is that this that this ethics committee is specifically for low risk research. So, so that's their initial cr criteria. If it's, if it's something that seems high risk, then they, they wouldn't take it on. Um, but Eddie said he'd be happy to follow up any questions if anyone had um, about that. Okay. Um, and the last, the last uh, aspect here is this idea of guerrilla thematic analysis. Um, so basically we were really focused on practicality in our analysis, thinking that how is this gonna be useful for the piloting network? That was, that was our primary concern rather than any uh, kind of theory building or um, contribution to the literature. That was our, our first sort of um, uh, priority. Um, so we didn't uh, didn't transcribe the, the nine hours of interviews. It just was impractical. It was gonna be um, impossible for us to do that. So what we did, we used the interview notes um, and we generated candidate themes from the interview notes. And then we uh, kind of uh, whittled down our themes, came up with our main ones just using that as our sort of main data. We only went back to the recordings to check the things that we think we may have misunderstood or um, give any sort of, uh, find any quotes for our, um, uh, for our uh, research and to share with, with participants as well. Um, I realize I've just, I've gone over time now, so I'm not gonna go over the final finding, but um, I'll, just, I'll just put the slide on there. So if in the recording, if anyone did wanna have a look at it, um, please take a look and maybe we can talk about it. Uh, I'm happy to go into it later on if people have, have questions, but yeah, I've gone over time, so I won't, I won't go on too much. Um, thanks very much, guys. That's, that's really interesting. And um, while we're getting to change, so maybe don't um, stop sharing the slides just yet. So just give us 30 seconds to read, to read this. I think it's really okay. interesting to look at the formats. And then, uh, and then we'll carry on with Rain, with Wayne. And once again, everyone, if you do have questions for Rob, feel free to put them in, in the chat box uh, and then we'll get to them um, after all the presentations and before the discussion. Apologies again about the disruption to my, to my talk, guys. 
as you say, it's the yeah difficulties of working from home, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just happened to be in, in the 12 minutes in the day where I really didn't want to be interrupted. So, <laughs> I mean. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. That's great. OK, so uh, Wayne, over to you. Right. Yeah, just sharing my screen. As Sam said, this is always, always the most nervous point, isn't it, actually? Um, <laughs> OK. One second. I'll just um, sort this out. By the way, what I'm just doing is, I think, Rob, we all want to know, who was actually at the door? It was my wife, and um, she'd, forgotten her, she'd forgotten her keys. <laughs> okay, right. I couldn't, I, couldn't have just, um, I couldn't have just left it. <laughs> <laughs> that probably would have been a bit cruel, yeah. Yeah, welcome, everyone. My name's Wayne. Uh, I'm carrying on this theme, really, of how we can do scholarship, given that we've got limited time and limited resources. Um, I mean, uh, Rob mentioned that he doesn't have a time allocation for scholarship, and I think that's true for all of us, actually. So... Um, we are looking at ways where we can get data kind of on the cheap and analyze it efficiently. Um, and one way you can do this is through the virtual learning environment, the VLE, which, I mean, as you can see from this list, they're very ubiquitous in higher education um, and in all sorts of environments as well, actually, for example, in the corporate world where they tend to use kind of different ones, uh, which have got slightly different purpose. Um, by the way, you do see some kind of competing terminology. People talk about learner management systems. Um, I don't have any kind of data for this, but I suspect that the term VLE is slightly more contemporary than LMS um, because the kind of the management side seems a bit top down, whereas the kind of current thinking about virtual learning environments is that actually the learners themselves are contributing as much as the people who put it together. Whatever term you use, um, the thing, virtual learning environments, there is very little research actually on how people use them. And they seem to be underexploited as well in terms of how people use the data because they, um, they contain a tremendous amount of data, which generally is not exploited. So the idea is we can exploit that um, because virtual learning environments, they're massive resources of input material, content, tasks, and also tests. And I think people have appreciated them more in, in the move online. I mean, most institutions have been using VLE for a while. Like we use Blackboard at Manchester. Uh, I think the latest version of uh, Blackboard, which contains all sorts of tools, including Collaborate for you know video conferencing. But obviously once things became online, more and more organizations started using them using a test, for example, online. Okay. Um, and one tool that you can use is item analysis. Um, I mean, the point of item analysis after a test is, I mean, very crudely, a lot of institutions have still got this divide between receptive tests um, and productive tests. Um, probably, I think John Field writes better to talk in terms of um, <coughs> literacy and oralcy. But um, when you look at the receptive inverted commas tests, um, reading and listening, still they still very much rely on objective testing. And um, obviously reliability um, is key because a test cannot be valid if it's, if it's not reliable. So it is a check on reliability. Um, I think as well, when we're making decisions, we'll talk about this later, but you do need to have some evidence which is based on data rather than just opinions. I mean, Sam's poll was very interesting at the beginning when he had gave the four options because very few people chose option one uh, of how they get evidence, which is based on which is based on data from tools like VLEs. The third point as well, auditing, is that um, there comes to a stage where we need to to, uh, we need to either us or external parties like the British Council or Bali look at what we're doing and information on the VLE it's out there for other parties to use in the information in the information process so um, and also um, I think in the piloting network uh, Rob touched on this um, 
uh, lit um, assessment literacy is a way of development of learning more about the system and developing as a teacher, which we probably don't pay enough attention to because um, assessment is often one area which we don't have a lot of resources for or people feel under-informed under about. Um, there's two kind of broad ways that you can look at it, um, item analysis through the VLE. I mean, one is a very general look at the test, basic data like how many people did it, um, how long did they take, which might be different from how long the test took. So if the standard area of measurement, et cetera. And then you can link that to CEFRA levels like B1 or B2. Um, the other area, just going into individual items. So how difficult are they and do they discriminate between candidates? So I just want to illustrate this now in the, in the, um, the next seven minutes or so I've got left. Uh, I'm taking examples here from... Um, a pre-sessional test which we ran listening um, last year. So you can see this is like a dashboard. So when you open it and you run it, and it is very easy to run, it's all there in there in Blackboard, the functionality. So, uh, I mean, it will look different on different virtual learning environments, but you can see literally a click. You can see how many people have done the test, um, how long it took, uh, discrimination, and the difficulty, which is looked at, uh, which they measure statistically. So on the dashboard, you can see all the, you can see all these things. Um, and I want to kind of illustrate by looking at individual items because I, I think that because I think that gives a fairer picture. So just by clicking on individual items, you can kind of get a window into how those items are functioning. So if we look at um, one item here, um, which um, it's called the discrimination is characterized as good. What that basically means is people who are doing well in the test as a whole will, 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 will get the right answer. People who are finding this test difficult, i.e. in their bottom, the bottom 25%, are more likely to get it wrong. That's what I mean by good discrimination. So obviously it'd be quite weird if people who were doing badly in the test got this item right. That would, that would suggest it's not discriminating very well. So that kind of information is useful um, when you look at revising the test. Because I think in terms of, in terms of like writing multiple, ch multiple choice items, the, pro the problem is not actually... Um, the ones which are wrong because you can write ones which are actually very close to the original or they're just ludicrous um so this is the one where it's got good discrimination so you can see that as you can see from the um the kind of balance there amongst the quartiles um here we've got one where um, um d is the correct answer and the discrimination is only fair so you notice that actually people who are scoring in the third quartile, um, the third 25%, a lot of them are getting, uh, uh, more of them are getting it right than people who are scoring in the first quartile. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad item, but possibly we need to revisit that. Okay, I'm going through this pretty quickly, but um, I think item analysis has quite serious limitations as well. The first thing is it's very dependent on sample sizes. So if you've got situations where not many people are doing the test, it might mean that statistics are actually, uh, you can't actually use statistics. I think one issue with kind of click and see kind of packages like VLE and SPSS is um, obviously you get all the data there, but it might not, theoretically, it might not work because um, there's not a normal distribution. It all depends on having a normal distribution, which depends on a certain sample size. You can actually do a power test to determine the actual sample size you, ne you need, but you've got to bear that in mind. Obviously, the bigger the sample, the more likely you are to have a normal distribution. 
Um, I think there's a limit to what numbers tell you. You still need that level of kind of experience of what tests actually look like. So in terms of what Rob was saying about the uh, the pilot scheme, I mean, yeah, you can use the data, but you do need people who have got a feeling for what test items actually look like, kind of going beyond the data as well. The data, um, I mean, it's nice to have the figures, but uh, that's not the end of the story. I think it's the start of the story, really. And the classic problem as well is just because the items are reliable doesn't mean they're valid. I mean, the relationship between reliability and validity um, is not symmetrical. So very often we spend a lot of time with multiple test items, making sure they're reliable, but um, they might be quite low in terms of validity. I mean, arguably any discrete item test is quite low in terms of validity because it's a discrete item test. It's not a performance test. But you've got to make sure that you're not over-concentrating on reliability at the, at the uh, expense of validity. Um, okay, so that's um, all I wanted to say, really. So I'd, I would say that VLEs, they are a great source of data, and we can access it um, quite efficiently. And it's a source of evidence which we can use in decision making, because very often we're, we're in a situation where we need to convince line managers and people outside the department to justify decisions about changing assessments. And often, maybe it's quite crude, but they are impressed by data rather than our, just our kind of subjective opinions. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'll hand back to um, Sam and Rob. That's great, Wayne. Thanks so much. Really interesting to see how the how VLE can be used to uh, conduct that kind of item analysis. Yeah, really valuable. I was thinking it would also be useful for, for kind of distractor analysis as well. I noticed one of those items, there were zero um or no yeah no candidates had selected abstract one or two which maybe will help with revising that item as well right um really interesting um so i reckon it's time to, to take some questions from you guys and then discuss um some of your ideas for scholarship um around assessment or or feedback um or, te or testing uh so um, there were some questions in the chat, which we can maybe talk uh, about now. And if you do have any other questions, either drop them in the chat or put your hand up and just um, and, and we can discuss them. So um, I think there were some questions about the presentation I gave. So let me just uh, get to those now. So uh, Rob, thank you very much for your question. Uh, uh, absolutely. So in terms of the, um, the effects that the change has had year on year, essentially you're talking about the impact, right? The impact of that analysis. And... Um, I don't have a, a lovely slide showing how it went up every year, but I can promise you with um, synthesis particularly, the scores the next year improved based on the on the amendments we made to the materials. And we also kind of stressed it more in teacher induction. So it gave us that, I actually gave a very similar presentation to our, to our teaching cohort in the teacher induction and said, look, this is what happened last year. So clearly we need to stress this more because students aren't getting this. Um, yeah, and so yeah, the, the scores for synthesis did go up, um, which was good news. Uh, there was also some questions uh, from Mary and from Philip. Thank you so much. Um, I think they're kind of sit there related. So um, that about uh, about reliability, essentially, yeah, and threats to reliability. Um, like in a, in a perfect world, I would have done um, something like facets analysis, uh, but that's really involved and it kind of goes outside the parameters of this kind of low resource research that we're getting to and kind of embedding it in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, I would say that within the normal uh, um, procedures of the assessment here at NTU, we had very thorough moderation. We had um, standardization procedures. We had about 20 to 30% of the scripts were double marked. Um, so we had really kind of thorough practices to make sure that um, the, uh, the grades were, were fair and right. And that was also, that wasn't just looking holistically at the score. It was looking at each of those sub-criterion. Um, I'm thinking about the, the, the double marking here. Uh, yeah, but as I say, like ideally, we would run something like inter-rater reliability, intra-rater reliability, right? Um, but just on a six-week pre-sessional where you've got three days to turn around the results, it's just kind of impractical to do. So we do what we can, and what we could do was, was standardization initially and kind of multiple bytes of standardization and then review sessions for anyone who is who um, who was under the standard or who was who was uh, different from the standard. 
and then uh, more opportunities for standardization and then thorough moderation and then double marking as well. Um, so hopefully that's that's clear. Um, there was another question just while I'm talking from Joy uh, about, I know I use Microforms, is this the source for the stats package or did you use another program? If so, which one? Thanks. So with Microsoft Forms, I just, um, there's an option in Microsoft Forms to download the, the data, the results as an Excel file, which I did initially just to produce the grades. And actually I had done this analysis the year before, but I used all the highlighted, the, the teacher highlights, like the physical highlights of the assessment criteria. And it was an absolute nightmare. Like it took what felt like half of my life. <laughs> I had, Letitia was talking about it earlier, I had like a pile of paper on this my desk and every day I'd come in and over lunch, I would just input the data and, and like myself ever so slightly less each day. And it got to the end and I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. So the next year I came up with this idea of using Microsoft Forms. Um, and then the stats pack, all I did, all I used was Microsoft Excel. Um, and I just conducted, um, uh, I just looked, conducted the standard, I uh, looked at um, different uh, descriptive statistics. So uh, just the means and the standard deviations, which you can do using an Excel formula. So um, equals average for the mean and then equals standard deviation for the standard deviation. It was really simple. And then just dragged it across the rows. So I had the standard deviations, the descriptive statistics for all of the sub criteria. Um, I can show you how to do that if you need, um, need to do that at any point. Yeah. You're on mute, Letitia. Yeah, mm. sorry, I didn't want to, I uh, clapping there, I don't know. I thought I was just raising my hand. I was clapping also. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was. Re I really liked your talk, Sam. It was really uh, lovely to see it visually, and I was thinking about how I could uh, apply it for uh, one of the, the, the modules that I, I teach here. I was just wondering how much you, um, you use the actual uh, scripts and then the materials to see not only what the, 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 the weaker performers weren't achieving from the, the materials, but also what the uh, high performers, like let's say for synthesis, like the, the next step, you know, to, to revise the materials, where you're then able to look and see exactly what wasn't useful in the materials and to discard it or? Oh, that's a really good, yeah. I wish I'd been clever enough to think about that when I did it initially. No, I didn't do that. I, um, I, what I did was um, I used some of the high performing students work as um, exemplars yeah, or to yeah. example the kind of yeah. practice we wanted in materials. But I didn't go and look at specifically which aspects of the materials were working. Now, that would have been, I guess, the next step or, or why. I mean, maybe there were, it might have been as simple as the, the language and the instructions yeah. was too difficult for the, for the weaker students, right? It could be something yeah. as, yeah, as simple yeah, yeah. as that. And the materials were the same for the different uh, courses, the long and short ones? Or... Yes, it was. So the, yes. the courses all fed into one another. So oh, yeah, yeah, the 20 week yeah. students obviously had more material, you know, had a longer course, but mm -hmm. they did the same six week block as the six week students. They just kind of yeah. fed into that final cohort. Um, and just Thank while, you. just going back, to, no worries, just going back to the question about um, packages and statistical packages. Um, let me just show you. Um, how I did it eventually so how I produced the scores as well so because I also wanted to give the students feedback right on their performance and that's one of the lovely things about when you have highlighted rating scales that um, uh, students get that that kind of nuanced feedback so what I did was I in it, without being really geeky about Excel like there are certain Excel black holes you can go down right and rabbit hole and I kind of went down a couple with conditional formatting which I won't go into because everyone gets super bored uh, and it's very geeky but essentially what I did was I had that data and I was able to pull the data to a template based on the student number. That student number became, became like, a, like the key and then that pulled all the data from other spreadsheets. And then what happened was, so you can see here, the students get individual, they get individual workbooks and this gives them their performance against each sub criteria. And then if this makes sense to you, it makes sense to you. You can use something called conditional formatting in Excel so then I was able to color code the criteria based on their performance. So I didn't actually have to physically highlight any assessment criteria, but they still got highlighted assessment criteria. Um, one colleague previously asked me to do a video on how to do this. So I think there's somewhere on YouTube, there is something about that, which I can forward the link to anyone if you're interested. Um, but I'll stop speaking now. <laughs> uh, good, good. So, um, I think there's another just looking through the questions and 
Rob and Wayne, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, so just see a question from Philip. So related to what Letitia has asked, did you look at some of the materials and feel they were okay as is? Perhaps a solution is sometimes shining a light on the Yeah, absolutely. So it wasn't, um, I guess it could have been a really blunt tool, right? It could have been like, um, here's the analysis, now I need to change X, Y, and Z. But actually, as you say, it's sometimes the changes are uh, more nuanced than that. So it might be just stressing it more in or focusing, you know, in in the teacher induction, um, there were elements where we actually just tweaked the materials a bit. Like I could look at them and think, well, actually, no, that's a bit complicated. And because it's complicated, it might be the students don't get it, but it also might be that the teachers avoid using it or using it in a different way because it's a bit complicated. So sometimes it was actually doing less, um, taking stuff out of the material because it was getting in the way of the main point of an activity. Um, so yeah, the, the the amendment wasn't always as simple as just yeah making a blanket change. Yeah, that's really interesting. Sorry, my camera's not working, but yeah, thank you for that, Sam. I mean, I I just thought it's it's interesting the, that aspect of human judgment of well, let's take a look and ha and see if anything's up here. But actually, you may look at it and think, well, maybe the, it's not the materials; it's something else here that that isn't getting across and sort of using that as a basis for for other decisions. But yeah, no, I think they've answered that very well. Thank you. Mm. No, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, it's also for someone who you know is developing materials, it's really useful data to have. Because ultimately, I could look at them and think, yeah, these are all great. You know, I, I wrote them to be really good. Yeah, I'm really happy with them. But or sometimes you know, this, maybe a teacher doesn't use them in the way that you intend. And you think, well, God, why aren't they getting it? They should just, the teacher should understand what to do. And, you know, it's, so it's kind of, gets rid of that knee-jerk reaction and actually shines a light on what aspects are working well. And there were lots of them that were working well, but you know, what can be what can be improved? Um, just looking uh, in, if I missed any questions, Rob and Wayne, feel free to, to jump in if I have. I don't think so, I think you've covered them. Okay, great. So I think it's um, time now then to hear other people's ideas of, of scholarship, um, activities uh, around testing, assessment and feedback. Um, 